The Forms of Prayer Prayer takes on different forms in our Christian lives. It is my desire to share with you the forms of prayer that we practice at the Yoido Full Gospel Church in Seoul, Korea not that we have exhausted all forms of prayer. Perhaps you may know a form of prayer that I have not included in this section. However, what I am about to share with you is based on our experience, and in many ways explains the source of our unique church growth. 1. Your Personal Devotional Life To guarantee our continual personal growth as a Christian, we must have a regular personal devotional life. If we stop praying, we begin to slow down as we move from impetus to momentum, as we have explained previously. In many parts of the world, Christianity has become a traditional religion full of ritualism and with little pulsating life. In today's fast-moving age, people find it difficult to institute and maintain a personal devotional life. Television plays an increasingly dominant role in our daily lives. This wastes even more important time that can be devoted to prayer. The more advanced the civilization, the more distractions exist to keep men and women from praying every day. The only way to keep from falling into this trap is to see the extreme importance of daily devotions. There are many reasons we should pray daily. The following are just two of them. 1. Our day must begin in prayer, for then God responds. God loves to move in our hearts early. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved, God shall help her, and that right early, the Hebrew meaning is during the dawn, Psalm 46 4-5. Awake up, my glory, awake, psaltery and harp, I myself will awake early, Psalm 57 8. This statement is repeated by David in Psalm 108 2. Both verses show David's practice of getting up early every morning to praise and worship the Lord. It is no wonder that God testified David was a man after his own heart. However, David not only praised and worshipped God early in the morning, he sought the Lord as well during this precious early time, O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee, my soul thirsteth for Thee, my flesh longeth for Thee in a dry and thirsty land, where no water is, to see Thy power and Thy glory, so as I have seen Thee in the sanctuary. Because Thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise Thee. Thus will I bless Thee while I live, I will lift up my hands in Thy name, Psalm 63one 4 God has promised that those who make it a practice to get up early to seek the Lord will find Him. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Proverbs 8:17. 2. When we begin our day in prayer, we have the spiritual and physical strength to carry out our responsibilities. With my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early, for when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Isaiah 26:9. Isaiah learned the judgments of God in his spirit as he sought the Lord early in the morning. I have learned that the wisdom of God that comes to me in my early morning devotions allows me to be more effective. In a few minutes I know what God wants in each situation. I don't have to spend days judging a matter, because I have the mind of Christ. Our devotional time must not only include prayer, but it should also include personal Bible reading. So often those of us in the pastoral ministry only look into the scriptures to get messages to preach. Yet, we must read the Bible to be spiritually nourished for our own hearts, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee, Psalm 119.11. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple, Psalm 119.130. God can speak to us from the scriptures if we give him the opportunity. The morning hours find our minds clear from all of the conflicts of the day, therefore, we are capable of receiving direction and instruction from his holy word. As a minister of the gospel, I must remember that my teaching and preaching must come as an overflow of my personal study. God's people who hear me will be blessed as I am blessed from the word of God. I can only motivate if I am motivated. I can only inspire as I am inspired by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I must read the Bible as part of my daily devotional life. 2. Your family devotions. Although it is well known and often repeated, this is still true. Families who pray together stay together. Not only in America. But in most of the world, television is increasingly becoming the center of most family activity. Between video games, news, and network programming, families are finding it increasingly difficult to eat together, let alone to pray together. Reports have been published showing that the average North American child spends 40 hours a week watching television, and each year the time increases. The divorce rate has skyrocketed. In some communities more people are getting divorced than are getting married. Satan seems to be winning the war that is being waged in the home. 
What will prevent the battle from affecting our homes? The answer is family devotions. The family's devotional time should include singing, Bible reading, and prayer. Honesty should be allowed during this time, especially for the children. I allow all my children to express their feelings, fears, and frustrations. This way we can keep open the flow of communication between us, and we can be drawn closer in an honest relationship. The alarming statistics that are now being published show that many suicides occur within the teenage demographical group. Young people feel the increasing pressures of alienation from their parents, plus coping with the strong conforming peer pressure. Therefore, many of our young people have turned to drugs, illicit sex, and alcohol. Once these artificial stimulants no longer work, young people plunge into despair and take their own lives. Psychologists say that the family is the only bastion of hope left for today's young people. If we keep honest communication with our children, they will be strong enough to resist the devil's attack. Satan also uses false religion to attack our young people. We are all familiar with religious cults that offer young men and women the pseudo-atmosphere of a home and family. Our strongest defense against such groups is a strong family devotional life. As God has chosen to share his burden with us, we should also learn to share our prayer burdens with our children. Why should our children see the results of our concerns, and then be left out regarding the reason behind them? How will they know how to handle problems by turning them over to the Lord, if they don't see us do the same? In our family, we usually gather in a prayer circle daily. We hold hands and begin to pray. One of my sons may be having a problem with one of his courses in school. This problem immediately becomes the problem of the entire family and must be brought before the throne of grace in prayer. For example, my prayer will be, Dear Lord, please help my oldest son with this test he is about to have. Let him learn his subject so well that he may get a high grade for your glory. Amen. My wife has concerns that are important too. My wife, Grace, is a most important part of my ministry. Yet, her concerns may be for the publishing company she runs, the music program with which she is involved, or even for the new dress she may need for a special function. Her concerns are the concerns of all of us. This brings our family into a oneness that cannot be easily broken. 3. Prayer in the Church Service One of the most important ministries of Yuido Full Gospel Church is the prayer in unison we have during every service. We always open our services with everyone present praying together at the same time. We may pray for the salvation and protection of our nation. Having been oppressed by the Japanese for many years and suffering invasion from the communist North Koreans, we realize that freedom, especially religious freedom, is precious and must be protected. We pray earnestly for our country. We also pray together for our leaders. God has commanded us to do this, and if we don't obey him, we will get the government we deserve. Therefore, we pray for our president, as well as our other leaders. For this reason, I have complete liberty to preach the gospel in my church, on television, and on radio. Many, especially in Europe, don't have the freedom to preach over the public airwaves. In Korea, we appreciate this freedom and guard it through prayer. We pray in unison for the thousands of requests that come to us from America, Japan, and the rest of the world. Every service finds me standing next to our prayer request podium, placing my hands on the requests as we all pray together. Before the requests are sent to Prayer Mountain, hundreds of thousands of people pray earnestly over them in each one of our seven services. We especially pray for a worldwide revival that will allow every nation to hear the gospel, fulfilling our mission till Christ returns. As the largest church in the world, we recognize that we have been given a special responsibility to pray for the Church of Jesus Christ in every nation. After my message, we pray together again. This time we ask the Holy Spirit to take the Word, and apply it to our hearts, so we can be doers of the word, and not hearers only. When we pray together, we pray with determination and assurance. When I hear my people praying, it sounds like the forceful roar of a mighty waterfall. We know God must hear the sincerity of our prayer, because we are praying in unison and unity. As we pray together, the power of God is manifested in our midst. Many have been healed, delivered, and filled with the Holy Spirit as we have united in prayer. If one can put a thousand to flight and two can handle ten thousand, can you imagine hundreds of thousands united in prayer the power is beyond comprehension. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together, Psalm 34 3. For Prayer in the Cell Meeting The cell system is the very basis of our church. I discovered this concept during one of the most difficult hours in my ministry. As a pastor of a church with three thousand members, I felt that I could do everything, and I tried to. I would preach, visit, and pray for the sick, yet, as my church grew, I became weaker. 
One Sunday as I interpreted for an American evangelist, I collapsed. Believing that what I needed was more dedication and fortitude, I tried again, but I failed to finish the service. I was rushed to the Red Cross Hospital. Pastor Cho, you may be able to live, but you must give up the ministry. With these discomforting words, my doctor greeted me in the hospital after I regained consciousness. What could I do except preach the gospel? I whispered to myself quietly. The realization of what had just been said fell on me like a heavy boulder. I have discovered that God sometimes has to go to unusual extremes to get my attention. I must admit, he got my attention in the hospital. The days that followed were times of reappraisal for my life. Yet, during that dark hour, I discovered the basic ingredient to the unlimited potential for growth in my church, the cell system. Luke records a similar incident in Act 6. When the number of the disciples was still small, the twelve apostles were able to do all of the administrative work in the church. However, if this situation had remained the same, the church would have never been able to grow beyond the number that was in Jerusalem. The way God changed the thinking of the apostles was to allow them to meet the potentially devastating problem that is described in the sixth chapter. The ethnic division that almost caused the first split had to be solved. What resulted was that the apostles realized they could not carry on the entire work of the ministry by themselves. Therefore, they called seven men and appointed them as deacons. The deacons took care of the administration of the church, and the apostles gave themselves to their original calling, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer, and to the ministry of the word, Acts 6 4. The problem seen in this chapter caused God's men to review their situation, and receive the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. That wisdom would cause them to delegate their authority to others, thereby allowing for unlimited growth. I noticed that in several places in Acts, the disciples met in large and small groups. The following are some quotes from Acts and Romans that opened my eyes to the validity of the cell system, and they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, Acts 2 46-47, and daily in the temple, and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ, Acts 5 42, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shewed you, and have taught you publicly, and from house to house, Acts 20 20. Likewise greet the church that is in their house, Romans 16 5. These and other scriptures gave me the direction I needed. Since then, our cell system has grown to the point that at this time, we have over 30,000 cells in our church. If each one of those cells leads just two families to Christ in one year, that gives us 60,000 new families. Since the normal family consists of four members, that gives us a yearly growth rate of 240,000 new converts. This does not count the members who are led to Christ through television, radio, and our Sunday worship services. Therefore, the continual growth of our church depends mainly on our cell system. Our cell meetings consist of five to ten families. They may meet in homes, which may be convenient for evening meetings or daytime women's meetings, schools, which is best for our student cells, factories, for our workers' cell meetings, or they may meet in a room of a restaurant, which is good for businessmen's meetings. Wherever they meet, they are the church in action. Our large church building is the place where the people come together to share the word of God and enjoy the worship of our church combined, yet our church is really meeting in thousands of locations everywhere in our area. In our cell meetings, the members pray for each other's needs. The cell leader visits them when they get sick and prays for their healing. Our people have been taught the central nature of prayer, so they pray over everything. They fervently pray for the church, the nation, and for a continuation of revival in Korea and throughout the world. They also pray for potential new converts so the church may continue to grow. In our cell leaders' conferences, I stress that the cells must have a clear goal in their prayers, therefore, our cells paint a clear picture of their goal as they pray in faith. Since it is much easier to lead a person you know to Jesus Christ, the cell member witnesses to his neighbor, friend, or relative. When God opens the door for this potential convert to be saved, the member will share this with the rest of the cell, they will not stop praying until that person comes to Christ. We have learned that we are at war against Satan in this earth. Our opposition is the devil and his demonic spirits. Our battlefield is the hearts of all men and women. Our goal is that all may come to know the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, we plan carefully, we have a strategy, we have a plan, and we execute that plan like a well-trained army. Yet, most importantly, we bathe our plans in prayer so that God may breathe his breath of life into our efforts, and they will be fruitful. 
I have not followed a secret formula in the mighty church growth we are experiencing. What I have done is simply take the word of God seriously. There is no question in my mind that what has been done in Korea can also be duplicated in every part of the world. The key is prayer. 5. Prayer at Prayer Mountain What we have called Prayer Mountain is really much more than a retreat area dedicated to prayer. Originally, this land was purchased for a church cemetery. Since Korea has been a traditionally Buddhist country, having a church burial place was very important to us. When our present church was being built in 1973, the dollar was devalued. This caused the Korean won, which is tied in value to the American dollar, to suffer, and we entered into a deep recession. Then, the oil crisis hit us, worsening our already fragile economy. Our people lost their jobs, and our income went down. Having signed contracts with the construction company, and experiencing an unprecedented increase in building costs, I suffered greatly, seeing the possibility of a financial collapse. Despondently, I sat in my unfinished church building, wishing the still bare rafters would just fall on me. During this crucial time in my ministry, a group from our church went to the property and started building a place to pray, mainly for their suffering pastor. Although I saw the need for this in our church, my concern was the added expenses that kept piling up on my desk. Seeing that only a miraculous intervention of God would deliver us from a catastrophe, I joined the intercessors at Prayer Mountain. One evening while we were meeting to pray on the ground floor of our unfinished church, several hundred joined me in prayer. An old woman walked slowly in my direction. As she approached the platform, I noticed that tears were filling her eyes. She bowed and said, Pastor, I want to give these items to you so that you may sell them for a few pennies to help with our building fund. I looked down, and in her hands were an old rice bowl and a pair of chopsticks. I said to her, Sister, I can't take these necessities from you. But, Pastor, I am an old woman. I have nothing of value to give to my Lord, yet, Jesus has graciously saved me. These items are the only things in the world I possess, she exclaimed, tears now flowing freely down her wrinkled cheeks. You must let me give these to Jesus. I can place my rice on old newspapers, and I can use my hands to feed myself. I know that I will die soon, so I don't want to meet Jesus without giving him something on this earth. As she finished speaking, everyone there began to weep openly. The Holy Spirit's presence filled the place, and we all began to pray in the Spirit. A businessman in the back of the group was deeply moved and said, Pastor Cho, I want to buy that rice bowl and chopsticks for $1,000. With that, everyone started to pledge their possessions. My wife and I sold our small home and gave the money to the church. This spirit of giving saved us from financial ruin. As the years have gone by, Prayer Mountain has grown to be a place where thousands of people go daily to have their needs met, fasting and praying. We have added a modern 10,000-seat auditorium, which is now too small to hold the crowds that come. Attendance varies, but normally at least 3,000 people daily are praying, fasting, worshipping, and praising our holy and precious Lord. In this atmosphere of concentrated prayer, healings and miracles are a common occurrence. Last year, over 1,288,000 people registered at Prayer Mountain. This makes this haven of prayer the front line of our attack on the devil's forces on this earth. Nowhere in this world are there more people praying and fasting. God hears our prayers, and the answers are too numerous to mention. In the chapter on fasting and prayer, I will more fully discuss the method by which we practice this biblical means of getting needs met. However, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of fasting and prayer in order to see revival begin and continue. Not only do we have group prayer at Prayer Mountain, but we also have individual prayer in our prayer grottos. These small cubicles are actually cut into the side of a hill. At these prayer grottos, people can get very still and quiet before God. In my own prayer closet, I can shut the door and commune with my Heavenly Father in concentrated and prolonged prayer. Previously, I called Prayer Mountain a haven of prayer. The reason I did this is that preparations are being made that will house thousands of people not only from Korea, but also from every corner of the earth. I believe there are many Christians who are longing for a place where they can meet God in a dynamic way. Not that God can't be found everywhere men seek Him in spirit and in truth, but there is no place on earth that has more concentrated prayer than Prayer Mountain. Christians are not satisfied with just hearing about the moving of God, they desire to see what God is doing. Therefore, roads are being built, proper housing is being erected, and facilities are being enlarged to accommodate what God is about to do. David wrote, He turneth the wilderness into a standing water, and dry ground into water springs. And there he mocketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for habitation, 
Psalm 107:35-36. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute, and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come, and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. Psalm 102:15-18. 6. All night prayer meetings. How can thousands of people spend every Friday night in prayer? Many people have asked me this question all over the world. If people can spend all night at a disco, why can't dedicated Christians spend all night praying and worshiping the Lord? It all depends on what and where our priorities are. Either we are serious about revival, or we're not. Our people gather at 10.30 at night, and begin to pray quietly every Friday. I then give a strong teaching from the Word of God. Since I am not under the time pressure that I must live under on Sunday, I can take my time and teach for two hours. It should become obvious that we do follow a prescribed program. People would not come so faithfully if they just had to sit and pray the entire night. Following our Bible study, we begin to pray. We pray for specific needs and problems in our church, as well as our own needs. After prayer, we begin to sing gospel songs. After the song service, one of my associate pastors will preach. Then, we sing again and get ready to hear personal testimonies of what God has done in our members' lives. There are so many miracles of God's grace taking place every week that there is no way possible to fit in all those who wish to testify. These mighty stories of God's provision cause us to want to sing again. Before we realize it, it is 4.30 a.m. and time to get ready for the Saturday early morning prayer meeting. After prayer, we are dismissed and go home rejoicing. David was accustomed to spending all night in prayer. In Psalm 63, he calls his all-night prayer meetings night watches. See Psalm 63 6. 119 148. Isaiah prophesied, Ye shall have a song, as in the night, when a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart, as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. 30 29. When the disciples were in prison, they did not spend the night complaining, they spent the night singing and praying. Therefore, God heard them and sent deliverance in the form of an angel. The presence of the Lord is most important. Jesus promised us that when we gathered in his name, he would be there. It is easy to spend the night, when the sweet aroma of our Lord's presence fills the place where we are gathering. In many parts of the world, Saturday is a day off for workers, in Korea, it is a normal working day. So for people spending all Friday night in prayer, it means that many will go home, and get ready to go to work. However, David stated that he could not give God what cost him nothing. See 2 Samuel 24:24. 24, 24. Although it is not easy to spend the night in prayer, it has been the means by which we have been able to maintain the revival. 7. Fasting and Prayer Fasting is voluntary and deliberate abstinence from food for the purpose of concentrated prayer. Usually, just food is abstained from, but on rare occasions, and for short periods of time, water is abstained from as well. In Christ's Sermon on the Mount, he taught his disciples about fasting. The teaching that our Lord gave also dealt with the motives of fasting, we should never fast to impress others. However, he expected his disciples to fast. He said, When ye fast, not if ye fast. Jesus was the example in fasting, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered, Luke 4 1-2. After Christ's fast, Luke recorded, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Verse 14. From the scripture just quoted, we can deduce this, being full of the Holy Spirit does not necessarily cause one to walk in the power of the Spirit. I believe the way into power, especially in prayer, is to fast and pray. Paul's ministry also began with fasting and prayer. See Acts 9-9. Paul testified to the Corinthian church that he proved his ministry by his spiritual discipline. In watching, in fasting, 2 Corinthians 6-5. Therefore, Paul was accustomed to fasting and praying watching meaning spending the night in prayer. In public gatherings, the early church fasted and prayed in order to know the will of God. In Acts 13, the Holy Spirit was able to clearly direct the church. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas, and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menin, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord, and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they sent them away, Acts 13 1-3. As the two apostles, Barnabas and Paul, 
started new churches, they taught the believers the same practice of fasting and praying that they had experienced in Antioch, and when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, and to Iconium, and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed, Acts 14 21-23, the previous verse shows that prayer and fasting were a vital part of gaining direction from the Holy Spirit before ordaining church leadership. Fasting combined with prayer caused the early church to have clarity of mind and spirit to establish its foundations. Fasting combined with prayer not only brings clarity of mind and spirit, releasing the voice of the Holy Spirit to give direction, it is also important for gaining spiritual and material victories. We see a perfect example of this in the Old Testament. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, had received a report that there was a large army gathering to attack. The army that was amassing at Judah's borders came from Moab and Ammon. We in South Korea know the feeling of having a hostile army amassed at our border. Rather than trying to fight with armaments he did not have, the king used his spiritual resources, he proclaimed a national fast. Everyone gathered together, men and women, boys and girls, they all fasted and sought the Lord's intervention. The result of this national prayer and fasting was that God won. A glorious victory. God gave the king directions on how to fight the enemy. I'm sure that no other battle had ever been fought like this one. Jehoshaphat appointed singers to praise the Lord before the army. When the enemy saw this, confusion came into their camp, and they began to fight each other. It took three days for the spoils of the battle to be picked up, as God had given them victory, without resorting to physical weapons. See 2 Chronicles 21-30. When we begin to fast, we should get the proper mental attitude. We should not see the fast as a punishment, even though our bodies may rebel at first. Fasting should be viewed as a precious opportunity to get closer to our Lord, not distracted by the daily concern of eating. We should also see the fast as a means by which our prayers may be more perfectly focused. This will cause God to hear and move in our behalf. Fasting, when it is viewed in this way, will be much easier. Normally I teach my people to begin by fasting for three days. Once they have become accustomed to three-day fasts, they will be able to fast for a period of seven days, then they will move to ten-day fasts. Some have even gone for forty days, but this is not usually encouraged. We have seen that fasting and prayer causes one to become much more spiritually sensitive to our Lord, causing more power in one's life to combat the forces of Satan. How does this work? The desire for food is basic to all living creatures. It is one of the strongest motivational forces at work in the body, even before birth. Babies are born with the natural instinct to reach out for the mother's breast. If we can combine this intense natural desire with our natural spiritual desire for communion with our spiritual source, then what results is a much greater intensity this is the purpose of prayer and fasting. By combining our natural and spiritual desires, we can cause the urgency of our petition to come up before the throne of God with such intensity that He will. Hear and answer. Desire is basic to prayer. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Psalm 37 4. What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark 11:24. The stronger the desire, the more effective the prayer. In my experience, on the first day of fasting, there is no significant effect on the body. On the second day, hunger increases more dramatically. On the third and fourth days, the body begins to demand food, and you feel the full physical effects of the abstinence. After the fifth and sixth days, the body adjusts to the new circumstance, and you feel better. What is happening is that the body is now more efficient in breaking down the body fats that have been stored. After the seventh day, the hunger pains disappear, although the body gets much weaker. However, there comes a clarity of thought and a freedom in prayer that is unusual. God responds to sincerity. When we fast, God responds to our sincerity in willingly humbling ourselves. His mercy and grace are released by the voluntary humbling and afflicting of the soul in the individual, community, and nation. As we see in many instances in the Old Testament, God fought for Israel when Israel humbled herself before Him. Satan is always trying to get through to us as we succumb to our fleshly lusts. He cannot penetrate the blood of Christ, but we can give him access through sin. Paul calls Satan the prince of the power of the air or the atmosphere around the earth. Jude's epistle says, Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. 
Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves, Jude 8-10. The verses just quoted reveal something very significant about our adversary, the devil. Satan is a prince with considerable power. Jude also states that the devil cannot be treated lightly, as some Christians are accustomed to doing. Although his power has been destroyed over God's property, he is still a formidable opponent. Jesus stated, The prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me, John 14:30. In other words, Satan had no landing field in Christ from which he could bring an attack against him. We must also live our lives in such a way that the prince of this world has no ground that will accept his attack. Germany, before World War II, developed a network of loyal agents in many countries. Hitler knew that he would need loyal allies if his plan for world conquest succeeded. Hitler called this group of men and women the fifth column. We must see to it that we have no fifth column in us that is loyal to Satan. How do we do this? Through prayer and fasting. Through fasting and prayer. You can so concentrate the power of prayer on your own lusts lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that you can live a holy and pure life in God's presence. Through prayer and fasting, the beachhead for Satan, which I have referred to as the fifth column, can be destroyed. Therefore, when the prince of this world comes, he can find no place in you. The practical results of fasting and prayer will be a true and undefiled religion being lived out in your life. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou sayest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh, Isaiah 58 6-7? Fasting can break the bands of wickedness, it can cause the oppressed to go free, it can bring total and complete deliverance. We are commanded to undo the heavy burdens. When we see heavy burdens in ourselves or in others, we can loose them through fasting and prayer. Whether these burdens be in health, business, or family relationships, these burdens can be lifted. Fasting and praying for others. As I have already stated, Prayer Mountain is dedicated to prayer and fasting. However, this prayer is not only for the needs of those present, but through concentrated prayer, we can see the thousands that write to our international office in Seoul prayed for as well. Once the prayer requests that arrive daily leave my desk, and are prayed for by our congregation, they are sent to Prayer Mountain. Once they arrive at Prayer Mountain, the prayer requests are placed in a prayer box in the chapel. These requests are prayed for in the 6 a.m. service every day for several weeks. By fasting, our praying intercessors have been sensitized to be keenly aware of the urgency of the request. They can therefore envision the need and visualize the answer. The testimonies that come to us of answered prayer are too many to include here. However, we have discovered that God hears and answers prayer combined with fasting. People come from all over the world to pray and fast at Prayer Mountain and receive a miracle. A few years ago, a polio victim visited Prayer Mountain. She had heard of the miracles that take place at Prayer Mountain and was determined to come, not concerning herself with the physical difficulties involved in travel. After sailing five days, she was met at the dock by one of our members, who placed her on a train. The young lady, only 23 years old, arrived with an expectancy that she would walk again. In the natural course of events, this seemed impossible she had been severely crippled since she was three years old. But, through God, all things are possible. After checking in, she immediately started to build her faith by reading the Word of God, seeking all the promises of God. As she was planning to stay three months, she determined to take two days out of every week to fast. During her stay, she was particularly impressed by the testimonies that she heard. Each time she heard someone testify to the miraculous power of God, her faith increased. After the first month, there was no visual sign of healing. Her legs were still mangled by the paralysis to which she had grown accustomed. During the second month, she felt renewed in her spirit and soul, but still unchanged in her body. However, during the third month, something began to happen. For the first time in many years, she could feel a sensation in her legs. Expecting a miracle, she cried out, Help me stand up. Please, someone, help me stand on my feet. I know I am healed. Seeing the tears and perceiving her excitement, a couple of our members joyously grabbed her arms and brought her to her feet. Yet, though her legs were feeling a sensation of blood rushing through her arteries and veins, she did not possess the strength to stand. Without showing any signs of disappointment, she slowly allowed herself to be seated again and continued praying. 
she knew that a creative miracle was necessary for the atrophied limbs to come back into use, so she patiently waited and continued to fast and pray. After the three months were up, she left, still in a wheelchair. But something had happened inside she knew she was healed. Several months went by before I received a beautiful letter from this young woman. In her letter, she stated that it took persistence, but the miracle finally came. Yes, Dr. Cho. Now I can walk, she wrote me. I still have a slight limp, but I am walking. I know that even the limp will disappear soon, she stated in complete faith. This is only one of many miracles that have taken place at Prayer Mountain. Will everyone be healed at Prayer Mountain if they fast and pray? Obviously, healing is not as simple as that. Some people get healed immediately, while others take longer. Yet, when people have great difficulty in getting healed, I have discovered that they may have unforgiveness in their hearts. Forgiveness and healing. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew 6 14-15 Many people have been wronged by their families, business associates, and friends. They therefore seek justice, as they perceive justice to be. If justice is not rendered in their circumstances, they become hateful and bitter. Many of these people will develop physical symptoms that are directly attributable to their unforgiving attitude. They develop a root of bitterness that gives off poisons into their systems and suffer both mental and physical anguish. But I am right. A lady told me once after I shared with her what I have just shared with you. My husband is guilty. I hate him. Yes, sister, I replied. But you are the one suffering from being crippled with arthritis. I will complete this story later. If we have been wronged, we must forgive. Even if we don't feel like forgiving, we must forgive. If the offending party has not asked for forgiveness, still we must forgive. Jesus is the perfect example. As he hung on the cross, no one was asking Christ's forgiveness. In fact, they were mocking and tormenting him. Yet, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Therefore, forgiveness is not optional, it is mandatory. It is not an occasional action, it is a way of life. Forgiving the person who has wronged you releases the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to the one causing you the problem. Nothing escapes the eyes of our Heavenly Father. He knows the intents or motives of the heart. The Holy Spirit is able to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, back to our story. The lady in my office had been married for many years. Her husband had left her and was living with another woman. Having to care for herself and her family, she was put under difficult financial circumstances. Now she was in my office asking for healing from her crippling arthritis. The Holy Spirit caused me to ask her, Have you forgiven your husband? No, I can't. I hate him, she sobbed, not able to control the tears. You must forgive him. I continued, This will cleanse your spirit of bitterness, which may be preventing your healing. It will also release the hand of the Holy Spirit in his life. After a while, she agreed to forgive her husband and to return to pray and fast at Prayer Mountain. The following Sunday after one of our services, I heard a knock on my office door. I invited the person to enter. A man, looking very grim, walked in first, followed by this lady. Pastor, this is my husband, for whom we have been praying, the woman said to me. She was hardly able to control the tears of joy as she turned to her husband and said, Please tell the pastor what happened. Pastor Cho, do you think God can forgive me? Her husband asked. Then he continued, I am a great sinner. A week ago I started feeling very guilty as I was at home with the other woman. I could not stand the pain that I felt inside. Suddenly, I started to think of my wife and children, whom I had abandoned. Not being able to relieve myself from the guilt that I felt, I thought of committing suicide. As Sunday approached, I decided to come to church, hoping to get forgiveness and to feel better. I then noticed my wife sitting across the auditorium. That is when I decided to ask her and God for forgiveness. Can God forgive me? Yes, he can forgive you. I answered. I then led him in the sinner's prayer, and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. What a joy it was to see the two reunited in Jesus Christ. Later, as the woman continued to fast and pray, she was able to get up from her wheelchair and be healed. However, she had already been healed internally through forgiveness before being healed externally in divine healing. I do not mean that everyone who is crippled or handicapped is suffering because of unforgiveness. Yet, many would be healed if they would only learn how to forgive. If you, the reader, have a problem in forgiving someone, don't let pride take over, keeping you from obeying God's word. Determine to go the extra mile, laying down your self-righteous attitude and forgiving that person. You will then experience a release of your hostilities and will feel much better. God resists the proud, 
but he gives more grace to the humble. Therefore, if you are having trouble with not having enough grace in your life, it could be that you are standing on your pride, and not on the grace of God. What do you have to lose except bitterness, resentment, and possibly ill health? And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. James 5 15-16 Psychologists, medical doctors, and psychiatrists now agree that the mental attitudes of their patients control, to a great degree, their success m healing. Now is the time for the body of Jesus Christ, the church, to be healed. God's attitude is shown in John's third epistle, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth, 3 John 2. The key to getting spiritual and material prosperity is linked to our soul, mind, prospering through forgiveness. Therefore, fasting and prayer, combined with forgiveness, will cause a greater degree of health in the church. This will make the vehicle God has chosen to bring revival a healthy and useful tool in the hands of the Holy Spirit. We have a great challenge. It is also a great opportunity. What is needed is greater people willing to forgive, sacrifice, obey, and commit. I have made myself available to the Holy Spirit to do whatever is in my power to be an instrument of revival and church growth. Won't you join with me? 8. Waiting on the Lord Meditation is the act of contemplating or reflecting on something or someone. It demands discipline, since the mind tends to wander on many different things. It is an integral and important form of prayer. Since our actions are affected by our thinking, if we can therefore direct our thinking, contemplation, we can control our actions. David prayed, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Psalm 19:14. God gave Joshua the secret of success and prosperity. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua 1:8. It is clear from this verse that God expected Joshua to meditate on something specific he was to meditate on the word of God. He was not told just to meditate on anything, but the strength of his mind was specifically directed to something concrete. When you meditate, you must focus your mind clearly on the subject on which you desire to meditate. So often, Christians begin to meditate on the Lord, but they allow their minds to wander uncontrollably. Eventually, they fall asleep or get bored. The reason for this is that God expects us to meditate specifically on something, not just meditate on generalities. To concentrate your mental faculties on a specific subject over a protracted period of time, you must delight in that thing. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditates day and night, Psalm 1-2. Therefore, to meditate successfully on something, you must be motivated. You must see the benefit you will derive from the thing upon which you are meditating. If you delight yourself in the word of God, then you will gladly meditate on it, and receive greater knowledge and understanding. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding, Psalm 49-3. In the book of Psalms, David was motivated to praise the Lord continually because he allowed himself to meditate on God's goodness in his life. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyous lips, when I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Psalm 63 5-7 And again, my meditation of him shall be sweet, I will be glad in the Lord. Psalm 104:34. The Apostle Paul also saw the importance of meditation. Writing to his disciple Timothy, he told him, Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. 1 Timothy 4:14 4, to 15 Timothy was therefore instructed to give himself totally to the ministry call given to him by the Holy Spirit. The way he could accomplish this total devotion was through meditation. Yet again, he was commanded to meditate on something specifically, not just generally on anything. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that the way to main lane perfect peace was to continually meditate on the Lord. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Isaiah 26 3. When I prepare my sermons, I ask God to enlighten my mind to know the mind of the Holy Spirit, who wrote the Word of God. After I finish writing my outline, I then meditate on the message I am going to relate to God's people. From the introduction to the conclusion, through every one of my points, 
The Holy Spirit gives me fresh understanding of what the word means and how to apply the word to meet the needs of the thousands who will hear the message. Although I have hundreds of thousands in attendance on Sunday, although the message is rebroadcasted in several countries through the medium of television, I believe that the Holy Spirit knows the need of every individual and will meet that need through my Spirit-anointed message. By meditating, I will know what to say and when to say it. Later I learn of something that was said that met the specific need of someone hearing the message. How did I know exactly what to say? I didn't, but the Holy Spirit knew and communicated it to my mind while I was meditating on my sermon. Not only do I meditate on my messages, but I also meditate on any new direction or opportunity that is before me. Some new avenue of ministry may look very appealing to the rational mind, but there may be pitfalls or potholes along the way that I may not know about, however, I trust the peace of God that I maintain in my heart. As I meditate on any important decision, the Holy Spirit directs me. When I am moving in God's will, I get a peace that is beyond understanding. Since it is beyond understanding, it is also beyond too much explanation. When there is something that will hurt me or the work of the Lord, I know it because the Holy Spirit shows me by lifting that peace. In order to have successful meditation, one must first get quiet before God. As one remains still, the confusion that surrounds all busy people departs, and one is ready to meditate. I find that it often takes at least 30 minutes to get quiet before the Lord. This is why discipline is so important if one is going to be a successful prayer warrior. One cannot allow the internal conflicts to trouble his spirit. He cannot allow external problems to affect his peace. One must maintain a heart quiet before God if he is going to have genuine meditation. The book of Isaiah has a natural break that occurs after the 39th chapter. It comes as a result of a change in direction for the prophet reflecting God's word. As God finishes his judgments in chapter 39, he then begins to comfort Israel in chapter 40. The 40th chapter ends with divine principles, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run, and not be weary, and they shall walk, and not faint, Isaiah 40 29-31. The prevailing principle in the verse just quoted is that natural strength is not enough to carry on the job before God's people. What is needed is strength that goes beyond youth and natural ability. Everyone who is willing to wait upon the Lord can be qualified to carry out the great task before them, because the source of their strength is not natural, but spiritual. Today, many people are so busy that they have little time for prayer, much less time to wait before the Lord in meditation. They cannot hear the inner voice of the Holy Spirit, because it is not a loud voice. Elijah learned this, and he, Elijah, came thither unto a cave, and lodged there, and, behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life, to take it away. And he said, Go forth, and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And, behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and went out, and stood in the entering in of the cave. And, behold, there came a voice unto him, and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? 1 Kings 19 9-13. Elijah learned that his direction did not come in the loud manifestations of earthquake, fire, or wind, but God directed him through the still small voice. The way to hear God's voice is to get still and meditate. If we are too busy to meditate, we are too busy to hear his voice. However, we are not to be casual about hearing the voice of the Lord. We must always remember that God has said everything doctrinally he will ever say in the scripture. We will never hear anything from God that will ever contradict the revealed and inspired Bible. The canon of scripture was closed with the last chapter of Revelation, which also includes the warning, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Revelation 22:18. Enjoying God's presence through meditation. One of the aspects of meditation enjoy is what I call taking a spiritual walk. Just as I enjoy the rare opportunities one get to take a casual walk without going in any specific direction, I enjoy meditating 
or waiting on the Lord without any specific purpose in mind. I simply sit in God's presence and enjoy Him. I don't have anything I desire, I just want Him. So I get alone and sit down in a comfortable chair, close my eyes, and wait on the Lord. I may hear nothing. I may sense nothing. But I always feel refreshed after my spiritual stroll with my precious Lord. I find that this type of spiritual refreshment can last for hours. Enoch is described in Jude, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude 14 to 15. Yet, Genesis says only, and Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah three hundred years, and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him, Genesis 5 22 to 24. What happened to Enoch? Enoch was a prophet in the earliest days of man on earth. At that time, men still knew the stories about the garden. They had heard of Adam's experience with the Lord in the cool of the evening in the Garden of Eden. Enoch prophesied about a day that is yet to come, the second coming of Christ to execute judgment on the earth. Yet, in the midst of Enoch's ministry, he learned to walk with God. God enjoyed the pleasure of his company so much that the Bible says, he was not. God took him to heaven so that he could enjoy him all the time. He also is waiting for the second coming of Christ when Enoch will be one of the countless numbers of the saints who return with Christ, the righteous judge. I have developed a close fellowship with the Lord that has sharpened my spirit and caused me to overcome the attacks of Satan. Nothing is more important to me than that unrestricted time of fellowship I enjoy so much. For many of my members, they like to go to Prayer Mountain for this kind of communion and meditation. Others have a special place in their home that is quiet. Where you meditate is not as important as just meditating. Have you established your time to meditate your time to enter into intimate fellowship with your Lord?